Good evening, as friends. Welcome to Daily News Analysis brought to you by Shankar AS Academy. Today's date is 9th September 2024. Today, we are going to discuss three important topics. The first topic is about uncommon cyclones in Arabian Sea. In this discussion, we shall be seeing about the basics of cyclones and why they are uncommon cyclones in Arabian Sea. The next topic is about delayed census. Why is there a delay in conducting census and what are the challenges in conducting census? So this is what we are going to see in the second article. The third article is about FPA, foreign portfolio investments and foreign direct investments. We shall be seeing about the recent trends in this FPA and FDA. So these are the three articles we are going to discuss today. The first two articles are from Hindu newspaper and the third article is from Indian Express newspaper. Now before we get into the discussion, I have an important announcement. Shankar AS Academy UPSC prelims to series is going to begin on 16th September. There will be 48 tests. Interested aspirants can check the link given in the description. Now let us get into the discussion. Now look at the first article. It is about uncommon cyclones in Arabian Sea. See, the Indian Ocean has warm waters that create cyclones and heavy rains, but it also experiences fewer cyclones compared to other oceans. The Indian Ocean has connection with Pacific Ocean and Southern Ocean, and these oceans bring warm and cold waters into Indian Ocean. So, the surrounding oceans affect the weather patterns of Indian Ocean. Another important aspect is climate change. Climate change is also causing Indian Ocean to warm up more quickly which impacts cyclone activity and ocean currents. The climate change affects global weather patterns including the cyclone behavior and monsoon rains around Indian Ocean. So this is what the article discusses. In this context, we shall see about the basics of cyclones and about cyclones in Arabian Sea. Cyclones form over warm ocean waters. The warm water heats the air above causing the air to rise. As it rises, the cooler air rushes to replace the warmer air. So this creates strong winds that start to spin around the eye of the cyclone. This center of cyclone which is very calm is called the eye of the cyclone. This is surrounded by a ring of strong winds and heavy rain known as eye wall. So the eye wall surrounds the eye. The region of eye is very calm whereas the eye wall has very strong wind and weather. So basically cyclones are intense low pressure system that cause significant damage when reaches the land. Now let us see what are the preconditions for cyclone formation. The first one is warm sea surface which should be above 27 degrees Celsius in order to provide energy for the formation of cyclone. The next one is Coriolis force. This Coriolis force is required to initiate and maintain the spin of cyclone. The third one is low wind shear to keep the cyclone structure intact. The fourth one is there should be a low pressure area or a weak cyclone where the cyclone build upon. So existing low pressure area is an important requirement for formation of cyclone. Then the last one is upper level divergence to support the rising air and intensify the storm. See, the North Indian Ocean is special because it experiences two periods of cyclones each year. This is different from other parts of the world. Usually, cyclones form during only one season of the year. Especially in the North Indian Ocean, the cyclones are formed during two seasons. So, why is there two cyclone seasons in Indian Ocean? The reason is Indian monsoon, which is a seasonal wind pattern, affects the cyclone formation in the region. The first season is pre-monsoon season during which a cyclone forms. This occurs from March to May. During this time, Arabian Sea and Bay of Bengal start warming up as the sun moves over the north part of earth. This warming creates condition that can lead to cyclone formation. The next one is post monsoon season which is after the monsoon. This happens during October to December. After the monsoon rains have ended, the ocean is still warm and the winds have changed their direction. So this creates opportunity for another type of cyclones to form. So the combination of these factors that is changing wind patterns and sea surface temperature result in formation of two distinct cyclone seasons in North Indian Ocean. Now let us see the formation of cyclones compared to Arabian Sea and Bay of Bengal. The Arabian Sea and Bay of Bengal are both the parts of Indian Ocean but they experience different conditions that affect cyclone formation. If you take Arabian Sea, the sea is generally cooler and has less convective activity. The strong winds during the monsoon season mix with the cooler waters below the surface water. So there is less chances of cyclone formation in Arabian Sea. If you take Bay of Bengal, this part of the ocean is usually warmer and has more convective activity, thereby it is more favorable area for cyclones. As a result, the Bay of Bengal sees twice as many cyclones as Arabian Sea every year. Another important information is that Arabian Sea has cooler temperature compared to Bay of Bengal and it also experiences stronger winds compared to Bay of Bengal due to the monsoon season. So the stronger winds due to monsoon and the cooler temperature makes it less available for cyclone formation. So this is why 
there is less number of cyclones in Arabian Sea compared to Bay of Bengal. Now let us see about cyclone Asna which is recently seen in the news. Cyclones usually do not form in the North Indian Ocean in August month. The last time this happened was in 1981. So this is why Asna attracted so much attention. So this is a rare August cyclone. The next interesting thing is most cyclones in Indian Ocean start over the sea. But Asna began as low pressure system over the land in India. So it gathered strength over the land because of the wet soil from previous rains. So this cyclone is a land born cyclone or land originated cyclone which is a rare event. Cyclone Asna moved from land and into the Arabian Sea where it found warmer waters and gave more energy to grow into full fledged cyclone. So it originated in the land and then transitioned to the ocean. So overall the cyclone Asna has unpredictable path and impact. So this is why it has gathered many attention in last month. So this is about the cyclone Asna. In this discussion we have seen the basics of cyclone and why there are uncommon cyclones and less cyclones in Arabian Sea compared to Bay of Bengal. And finally we have seen some points about cyclone Asna which is a recent cyclone in Arabian Sea. So with this let us wind up the discussion. Now let us see an MCQ question related to this article. Which of the following statements is correct about tropical cyclones? Tropical cyclones form over warm ocean waters near equator. The Coriolis effect causes cyclones to spin in the same direction in both hemispheres. Look at the third statement. Tropical cyclones usually weaken when they move over land or colder ocean waters. As we have seen in the discussion, the first statement is correct. Tropical cyclones form over warm ocean waters. Look at the second statement, it is incorrect. The Coriolis effect causes cyclones to spin in different direction in northern and southern hemisphere. So this statement is incorrect. Look at the third statement, cyclones generally weaken when they move over land or colder waters. So this statement is correct. So the correct answer is option B. With this, let us conclude the discussion and move to the next news article. Now look at the second article. He talks about a 14 member standing committee on statistics which was chaired by economist Pranab Sen. This standing committee on statistics was dissolved after there were concerns over delayed 2021 census. This standing committee on statistics was formed in July 2023 and this committee was tasked with advising the government on survey methodologies but this committee faced an overlap with steering committee for national sample surveys. So this is why this committee is recently suspended. Also note that there was delay in conducting census which was initially delayed by COVID-19 but still now there is delay in conducting census. So in this context let us discuss the basics of census. What are the challenges in conducting census and about delimitation. Firstly what is the purpose of conducting census? The census is conducted every 10 years and is the largest source of data on demographics, socio-economic conditions and population dynamics. It provides critical data for policy making, planning, administration at all levels of government. So this helps in effective distribution of resources. The last census was conducted in 2011 and the 2021 census is being delayed. Now let us see about the delimitation. Delimitation is a process of redrawing the territorial boundaries of electoral constituencies. This will be done based on the data from most recent census. The Delimitation Commission uses census data to ensure fair representation in parliament. It is also used for state legislatures for adjusting seats based on the population changes. So this is the purpose of conducting delimitation. Until now there were four delimitation commissions set up by Indian government. One in 1952, 1963, 1973 and 2002. So there were four delimitation commission which were set up until now. Lastly the 84th amendment which was introduced in 2001 froze the delimitation of constituencies until 2026 census. So if there is any future delimitation commission it will require the census data which is recent census data. As of now we have not yet conducted the 2021 census and this is also delaying the delimitation process. Now let us see the reasons for delay in conducting census. The first important reason is COVID-19 pandemic. The 2021 census was postponed due to outbreak of COVID-19 pandemic and also due to the second wave of the pandemic in particular. So this caused disruption in essential surveys like house listing operation. The second reason is administrative and logistical issues. See conducting a census is a massive logistical challenge which involves millions of enumerators. The lack of timely governmental notification and preparedness may also contribute to these delays. The Ministry of Home Affairs under which the Register General of India operates had to postpone the census notification several times due to logistical reasons in pandemic. So the responsibility lies with the Register General of India 
who operates under Ministry of Home Affairs. The third reason is technological and methodological changes. The 2021 census was supposed to introduce technological advancement such as online self-enumeration and digitized surveys. Transitioning to this new methodology may have led to delays in training, technical readiness and implementation. So this is also an important reason for delay in conducting census. The last one is resource allocation and political consideration. The census plays important role in distributing resources and political power. So if there is any delay in census, it may result from political calculations to avoid immediate changes in allocation of electoral seats. That is, the delimitation is postponed by postponing the census. The 42nd constitutional amendment, which was introduced in 1976, froze the delimitation of parliamentary and assembly constituencies until 2001. As we have seen earlier, the 84th constitutional amendment in 2001 have froze the delimitation until 2026. Now let us see what are the consequences in delaying census. The first important consequence is impact on delimitation. As we have seen earlier, postponing the census will lead to postponing of delimitation process and this will lead to unequal political representation. The next important consequence is resource distribution. If you are not conducting a census in 2021, then the government is using the census data of 2011. It means it is an outdated data. So with outdated data, if you are producing a policy, if you are creating government initiatives, then it will lead to inequitable allocation of funds. This means there will not be an effective resource distribution. The third important consequence is planning and implementation of schemes. Due to outdated data, there will be less effective targeted interventions and this will impact the larger public. The next consequence is about surveys and economic planning. The National Sample Survey Organization produces many data and indicators for governance. If they are using outdated data of 2011 census, then it will be an inaccurate baseline for economic indicators which will affect the planning and governance. Next about the population growth and migration data. The delay in census will hinder the understanding of migration trends and population growth which lead to policy paralysis. So these are the important consequences of delay in census. The first is impact on delimitation, next is impact on resource distribution that is unequal resource distribution. Third one is planning and implementation of schemes, improper planning and improper implementation of schemes. Then there is mismatch in surveys and economic planning, inaccurate baselines will be used by NSSO and then there will be a population growth and migration data will be lacking. So this will lead to policy paralysis. So these are the important consequences of delay in census. Now let us see an important MCQ related to this question. With reference to delimitation commission, consider the following statements. The orders of delimitation commission cannot be challenged in court of law. When the orders of delimitation commission are laid before Lok Sabha or state legislative assembly, they cannot affect any modification in the orders. Look at the first statement, it is correct. According to delimitation act, once a delimitation commission publishes its final orders, then they are legally binding and cannot be challenged in the court of law. So this statement is correct. Now look at the second statement. It is also correct. Once the delimitation commission orders are laid before the parliament or state legislative assemblies, they are for the information purpose only. There will not be any modification after it is submitted. So both the statements are correct and the correct answer is option C. Both one and with this, let us conclude the discussion and move to the next news article. Now look at this article. As we all know, there is a Hindenburg report which has attracted huge attention last year, and there were two foreign portfolio investors which is mentioned in the Hindenburg report. The SEBI has asked the details about the beneficiaries of the two FPIs which were mentioned in the report, and the two foreign portfolio investors who are based in Mauritius have asked some time for disclosing the information. So this is the crux of the news article given here. In this discussion, we are going to see the basic information about FPA, that is Foreign Portfolio Investors, FDA, Foreign Direct Investment and FIA, Foreign Institutional Investment. So we are going to learn about these three important concepts in this discussion. The first one is about foreign institutional investment. The investment which is made by a foreign institutions like mutual fund, pension funds or insurance companies in another country's financial market, mainly in stock and bonds. So this type of investment is called foreign institutional investment. For example, a large investment company from Europe decide to invest the 
Indian stock market. So the investment company in Europe will buy shares of Indian companies in Indian stock market. This is considered as foreign institutional investment because the investment is made by an institution and not directly in the company's operation. Normally the foreign institutional investment overlap with foreign portfolio investments and they are influenced by global economic conditions, the performance of Indian markets and regulatory changes. In recent months, the net foreign institutional investment inflow have contributed to India's equity market but the withdrawals can be observed in the sectors like manufacturing. Overall, the foreign institutional investment have supported India's equity market but there has been a decline in foreign institutional investment in sectors like manufacturing. So, this is the trend of FII in India. As I said earlier, the FII often overlap with foreign portfolio investment. Now, let us see about the foreign portfolio investment. It is an investment made by a foreign investor in another country's financial market by buying and selling financial asset such as stock and bonds. So, in this case also, the foreign investor does not have a direct control over the company's operation. For example, take an individual investor from Japan. This investor will buy shares of Indian companies through a broker. This is an, for, this is an foreign portfolio investment because the investor is purchasing the shares of a company and he is not involved in the management or operation of the company. So, the foreign portfolio investment is done by a foreign investor without acquiring the ownership of the company in India. So, in both cases that is in foreign institutional investment and in foreign portfolio investment, there will not be any acquirement of ownership of the company. Just they will buy the shares. Now, let us see the trends of the foreign portfolio investment. There was significant increase in FPI in 2023, especially in equity market. But recently, the inflow of FPI has been impacted by SEBI's new disclosure norms. These norms have required the FPIs to disclose the beneficiaries of FPI. So, there were many outflow of FPI in August 2023. From then onwards, there is significant decline in FPI. Now, let us see about the foreign direct investment. When a company or individual from one country invest directly in the business or assets of another country, which means they will be usually setting up the operations or acquiring a substantial stake in a company. So, this is called foreign direct investment because they are investing directly in a company's operations. For example, if a US company like Apple decide to build a new manufacturing plant in India, then it is called as foreign direct investment. This type of investment is called FDA because the Apple is directly investing in setting up and running a industry in India. So, this is about FDI and if you look at the trends of FDI in recent years, the inflow of FDI has declined by 16 percentage last year. The sectors like manufacturing, computer services and communication services have seen a decline in FDI inflows last year. Even though there was decline in these sectors, there was still a major FDI inflow in sectors like semiconductor industries and technological related sectors. The government focus on attracting FDI is regarding technology and green energy sectors. So, the government is implementing many policies to attract FDA in these sectors. So, this is about FDA. Let us compare the three terms, the foreign institutional investment, foreign portfolio investment, foreign direct investment. This is institutional. This can be both institutional and non-institutional, which means it can be done by an institution or individual investors, which is non-institutional. It is done only by institutions and not by individual investors. It is a direct ownership which means setting up a plant or owning a part of company. It means acquiring direct ownership in the company. The purpose is for short term returns. They are just investing in the stock market. This FPA is also about short term investment. As I said earlier, FIA and FPA are closely related terms and they overlap most of the times. The FDA is about long term growth and control. Regarding stability, these are moderate, this is volatile and this is very stable because it is a long term investment. Both FIA and FPA are regulated by SEBI and FDA is controlled by government policies. So, this is about the three terms in the discussion. Now, let us discuss an MCQ related to this topic. The foreign direct investment involves acquiring ownership or control in foreign countries business. Yes, this statement is correct. FDA is primarily a short term investment aimed at gaining quick returns. No, this is incorrect. As we have seen in the discussion, it is a long term investment. FDA inflows are considered more stable compared to FPA. Yes, this statement is also correct. It is a long term investment and it is a more stable investment compared to FPA and FIA. So, the correct answer is option C. The first statement is correct. The second statement is wrong. The third statement is correct. So, the correct answer is 1 and 3 only. With this, let us conclude the discussion. Now, we have come to the end of the discussion. If you like the video, please share it with your friends. And don't forget to subscribe to Shankar Ace Academy YouTube channel. Thank you for listening.